Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, a warm welcome. My name is uh, Shaheen. I'm the chair of the board of ICFA. On behalf of the ICFA board, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the ICFA 2023 annual conference. Today's conference is themed the right time and the right place, improving access to humanitarian quality funding. It is an honor for me to be here today with all of you, members, partners, colleagues, and friends. Thank you so much for joining us. The topic of this conference is not an easy one, but it is essential. The situation is challenging and the theme is complex, but it shows that ICVA does not shy away from addressing important and relevant topics. We have substantial expectations for today's conference. Firstly, we expect to increase awareness, share experiences and establish a common understanding of the key challenges within humanitarian financing. However, we don't want to focus solely on challenges. We also want to explore opportunities and solutions and see how together we can build on them. We are fortunate to have a number of distinguished speakers who will guide us through today's discussions and I thank them all in advance for their availability. Today's conference will consist of five interactive panels where we will really zoom in on specific subjects. The first session will give us an overview of the humanitarian financing status against the humanitarian situation. The second will focus on the grand bargain, while the third will concrete, concentrate on climate financing and humanitarian action. The fourth session will center around partnerships. And finally, Ignacio, ICVA Executive Director, will provide a wrap up of the day and highlight a few takeaways. It will be a full an exciting day, and to make the best of it, we must create a safe space where we can express ourselves freely, respect each other's opinions, especially when we differ, and protect ourselves. If there are any concerns during this conference, please contact Alon. Alon is there. He is the ICVA Senior Policy Officer, PSEAH, and Diversity. Before we begin with the content discussion, I just want to remind you of a few house rules. Coffee breaks and lunch will be served upstairs, so there will be no food or drinks uh, allowed in the conference room. And please, we will strictly follow the agenda, so do please respect it. And now I'd like to hand over to Stephanie Yusuf, who's the ICWA Deputy Mina Region, who will chair the first session. Stephanie, over to you, and thank you all for being here today, and I wish you a very productive and enjoyable conference. Thank you, Shaheen. Um, it's absolutely wonderful to be here with you this morning. It's such a nice day and a room filled with colleagues and friends of ICVA and a wonderful panel. So we are super excited to be here today and to start with such a, a, a wonderful panel today. Um, it is it is an honor to kickstart this session uh, with uh, this high-level panel discussion that will frame this annual conference and establish a common understanding of various humanitarian challenges. This panel will aim to spark important understanding uh, conversations relating to humanitarian financing gap, the efficient and adequate resourcing of humanitarian action, and, efficient, and especially locally-led responses and other related issues. During the session, attendees are encouraged to start exploring forward-looking solutions to anticipate trends that heavily affect the humanitarian space, such as climate-related crisis, pandemic responses, protracted crisis, and conflict-related emergencies. For this panel discussion today, it's an absolute honor to have with us our distinguished guests, friends, and colleagues of ICVA. And joining us today are His Excellency, the Ambassador Jörg Leber, permanent resident of Switzerland to the United Nations and to other international organizations in Geneva, Switzerland. And Mr. Martin Griffith, the Under Secretary General of Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator of OCHA. Ms. Taiba Rahman, the President of Naikala Association and a member of Akbar Association and Ms. Sophia Sprechman, the Secretary General of CARE International, and of course our very own Executive Director, Ignacio Packer. All biographies are available online and we encourage you to uh, join and read them uh, further. And it is an honor to have this panel today share their thoughts and insights on humanitarian financing today. For this session, 
We'll propose a kickstart question to each of the panelists and we'll they'll have uh, some dedicated time to speak to you from their experience and from their lens on humanitarian financing. And at the very end, we'll have some time uh, dedicated for Q&A and attempt to make it as interactive as possible. It is an honor to start off the session with you, Your Excellency, given that Switzerland is where ICVA is registered, it's where we have our annual conference and we're convening members and partners together to network, exchange, and coordinate. Can you please share your insights on the importance and dedication of Switzerland to creating this enabling environment for NGOs? And what are the concrete commitments to humanitarian financing? Over to you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Thanks you. Thank you all for having me here. I'm really excited to be here uh, in this uh, circle of uh, Unitarian experts, uh, it's really fantastic to be on this panel. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we tried with the weather, uh, so please make good use of it during lunch break. Uh, go outside, it was a hard negotiation, but, uh, but you're all used to hard negotiations. Thank you for the questions. Um, I, I actually like to uh, speak to, to the three points. First, I, I want to thank ICVA uh, for all your work. You're a very important uh, partner to us. We feel that you are really able to bring the community together to be also a good voice for the community, that's important for us. Uh, we are not able to reach out to all the relevant NGOs uh, who are working in the field through ICVA. We can do this through events like today. We have a, a possibility to exchange that is really important uh, to us. And uh, I understand on we, we committed for another three years of support to ICVA. That doesn't mean only three years, but at least the next three years. Uh, are, are assured of our support. Which brings me to the second point. Why are NGOs um, so important uh, as a partner uh, in our humanitarian commitment, engagement, but also here as a host state um, in Geneva. Of course, you are all aware of the importance of NGOs. I don't need to explain that uh, to you, but increasingly so, because we all know the, the context, the circumstances. Uh, time and again, I've heard Martin and other humanitarian leaders describe how the humanitarian needs increase consistently year after year after year. Resources are not necessarily keeping up. So we need to be smart about how to use these, these resources. And, and NGOs play, uh, in our opinion, a key role in, in two respects. One, for the implementation on the ground. More and more also uh, my colleagues, uh, humanitarian experts in Bern, uh, really push um, implementation through local partners. I know, uh, Martin, your organization does the same. Our partners uh, do the same. And their NGOs obviously play a key role because you are on the ground, you know the local needs, you know the local networks, you are the implementation, implement, implementing actors, partners, that makes you so important uh, for us in the field. The second, your presence in Geneva is important for us because Geneva, International Geneva is, is two things. It's on the one hand an operational hub uh, where some of the big humanitarian agencies are uh, from where they distribute, they send the resources, uh, the people into the field. But it's also where policy discussions take place and where normative discussions take place and where policies are being developed. And you need to be part of that discussion. When, when the humanitarian agencies in Geneva discuss among themselves what are the necessary responses, wh where, what's the best practices, wh how do we frame uh, humanitarian action on the ground? We need the NGOs represented here in Geneva. We need you as a voice here to participate in these discussions. That's maybe not what you think of your activity or importance in the first place because you're very field oriented, but we need you here in Geneva. We he need to hear your experience from the field also in Geneva so that we don't have ivory tower decisions by, by, by uh, academics <laughs> here in Geneva, but things that really make sense on the ground, which is why we as uh, Switzerland as a host state uh, that's our commitment. We want to continue to offer to you also here in Geneva the best possible working conditions so you can, uh, you can be here. We do this together with the Canton of Geneva, uh, supporting you, helping you uh, come here, find a good environment and do that important work. 
The, the second um, element in our Switzerland's response to the context I described, increasing needs, uh, not necessarily fast enough increasing resources, is, is predictable, flexible and, and smart uh, financing of humanitarian action. And there I better read from my text because otherwise you will certainly and very quickly realize that I'm not the topmost expert on the issue. So please uh, bear with me. Uh, a few examples for how we, we approach this, how we try to work with our partners to have this kind of, of reliable, uh, flexible uh, funding. Uh, you probably know that last year Switzerland used new modalities to increase the flexibility of softly earmarked humanitarian funding with one of our main partners. You're not surprised that it's going to be the ICRC. We allowed... Uh, <laughs> there are others. <laughs> we allowed for ex post allocation of funds uh, which allowed the ICRC then to redirect our contributions to humanitarian crisis situations that are notoriously uh, neglected and underfunded. Um, uh, examples uh, like Ethiopia, the DRC, Nigeria, and Venezuela. That's one example. A second, as co-chairs of the country-based pool funds, the CBPF, uh, we, Switzerland, are working with other donors and OCHA uh, in setting up resource facility, a resource facility that will support the in-person participation of local actors in this facility and in the governance discussions to help them access their funding and ensure they deliver on their objectives. That's the second point. The third example, we also signed, uh, of course, the grant bargain and we championed its caucus on the role of intermediaries, which committed to increase quality funding to intermediaries, intermediaries in return committed to increase the quality and quantity of funding to local and national actors. We are reviewing our contracts with the intermediaries to secure they will, for example, cover the overhead costs of local humanitarian organizations they work with, just as we cover their overhead costs. And there, uh, maybe uh, just one remark, um, we still have, of course, um, our parliament on the back, our taxpayers on the back. So transparency of financial flows, accountability of what happens uh, with financial contributions will remain, I have to tell you, uh, will remain uh, very important. And then my last point or my last example, we are also part of the Good Humanitarian Donorship. Uh, you know this, it's an initiative also working around flexible and quality funding. And though the principle were established already 20 years ago, they are still very relevant in today's humanitarian context, such as the 11th principle, which is about making sure that funding of humanitarian action in new crisis does not negatively affect meeting the needs of ongoing crisis. And that's, of course, an issue that probably you will uh, discuss a lot today. We have uh, one uh, particular situation in Europe that attracts a lot of funding and we really have to be careful, and that's another commitment. We don't, that doesn't mean for a donor like Switzerland, we will neglect other situations that are ongoing outside of Europe. So thank you very much again for having me. Uh, thank you, Iqua, for uh, your important work. Thank all of you uh, for your work you're doing in Geneva, and especially also uh, on the ground, also through you, your colleagues. We couldn't do the humanitarian work we want to do without the local partners. And I know many of you work in very, very, very difficult circumstances. So my, my deepest respect and thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador, for expressing your commitment to the NGO community, to local action, to quality funding, and to engaging the importance of engaging uh, NGOs to be engaged in political action as well. I think this is an extremely uh, uh, great point. Thank you for starting with that. And to build further on the funding situation, I want to ask you, Mr. Uh, Griffith, how the ERC sees the current funding situation vis-a-vis -vis global humanitarian needs, and what are two to three funding uh, solutions to the funding gap that the ERC is currently pursuing? Good luck. 
<laughs> Thank you for the questions. Thanks, thanks a lot, very seriously. I want to start rather like you did um, with a comment or two about ICFA. Um, I was the chief executive of an NGO called Action Aid way back in the early 90s, a long time ago. I'd never been to Geneva, um, as you can imagine. Um, we were a member of ICFA. And my first visit ever to Geneva was uh, on the back of ICFA. And I remember going to ICFA's office at the time. We had some issues of humanitarian intervention and so forth at the time. And what you did in ICFA for me on that occasion, I didn't know my way around at all, was you, first of all, told me where to stay the night. That was very helpful. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, but then you took me, I think, it, to an early meeting, some international meeting in the Palais. Um, and you got me in and you prepared the way and you looked after me and you made me feel like I was part of a community which I had never um, visited before. And I was incredibly grateful for that and I knew I'd never come back to Geneva in my life. <laughs> Here I am, you can't keep away. It's the weather, as York says. Um, so thank you, uh, Ikva, for that because I know this is what you do on a daily basis. Uh, trying to, in, in terms of the, 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 the issues, I want to say, as, as, as usual, three things. And they are sort of, I think they're linked to the issue of funding. Um, number one, as, as everybody in this room knows more than me, one of the um, particular challenges, or in, in other words, failures, of the humanitarian community is to have, create, and be driven by, and to be dominated by, the engagement with the people in the communities that we serve. The clunky term, as we all know, is accountability to affected people. Um, the reality is that, of course, it's extraordinarily varied in how it works across the world. Um, but it is of the highest, the highest importance. And yesterday I was talking uh, on a call with a colleague in Goma, in uh, Eastern DRC, who, and I, and I, I said to her, how do you manage to do the magic, which is essentially to make sure there is the time, the quiet, the patience, the listening, to create that relationship in your busy day, particularly, as you can imagine, in the Kivus. And she said, well, look, you're calling me up. You're, you're a busy person. You know, it's not difficult to find time if you think it's important. And we need to make sure, and I speak for the... Um, UN agencies here in particular, those big beasts, we need to make sure that the ICFA message, because ICFA does get that relationship right a lot more often than the rest of us and the members here, that we then are driven by you as to how we can, in the field, in all the places that we work, make that relationship the central programming proposition. So it's, yes, it's localization. Yes, it's making sure that money goes through to the frontline organizations, much more so than it is now. Um, but it's also getting different skills into our leadership, the skills of listening, the skills of stopping, the skills of, uh, of, of respect. That's the principal thing. And for OCHA, for me, recently re-arrived in OCHA, that is the overwhelmingly most important priority. To facilitate that, uh, we, we, we all know that we have to lighten the load of programming obligations. Uh, in, in the, I, I've been away from the humanitarian world for 20 years. I came back to find this very professionalized system. Humanitarian response plans are massive, take a huge amount of time, very, very detailed, very good on accountability. But the time needed to do it is not proportionate, in my view, to the value that you get from it. And the time needed to listen is much more relevant uh, than is the time needed to program. So, get, so we need to do less of that and more of the other. And, and the relevance to the question, if I could just sort of try a leap here, of course, is that priorities genuinely discussed and understood and sifted and then uh, applied from that conversation with the affected people is money much better spent. Is money much better spent. So there's uh, uh, all these efforts to make our money go further 
I think, for me, start with that relationship. That's my first point. The second point um, is, a, is, is something that um, Ignacio, I think, um, we, uh, I was told by a representative of Intersource at one of your meetings that you convened for us on, on Afghanistan, in fact, earlier this year. And he said, do you realize that there is no place that humanitarian development and climate actors sit together and discuss? There is no forum. There are many places where you sit together and eat and drink and so forth and travel, uh, the, the, the curse of our lives. But working together, we don't do it. It's an astonishing gap. And this leads me on to my second key point about us, which is the need for us to uh, empty the silos. That the nexus is not about policy, it's about relationships. The nexus is about listening to the fact that people do not distinguish in the front line between humanitarian and development and climate, even weird, more weirdly. Getting that right, a, a process which would bring us together consistently in the field first and then back, I think is of the highest importance. And the corre cor correlation of this is that we need to be supporting development funding. Many is the time that I, and I'm sure many people here, have had discussions with donors, and they say to you, look, times are tough, money is short, don't worry, we're obviously going to protect our humanitarian budget. Development, I'm sorry, that's not going to happen. Uh, we don't have enough money for that. That is not a good message. Because what many of you, of course, do both in this room, development processes are far more efficient than we are at certain things that are fundamentally necessary. Keeping those structures going, basic services in Afghanistan, an absolute theme of the last couple of years, we need to defend and protect the people who are not in our professional community. And sitting together, learning together, and being told what to do together seems to me to be an obvious priority. And then thirdly, I want to say two words on climate. The link here is climate money, but actually that's not the, the link that I want to focus on. Of course, climate adaptation and loss and damage money should assist us. I was talking to a colleague in Mogadishu day before yesterday. The terrifying prospects, as you know, in Somalia, coming down the track, a sixth rainy season, ready to fail. IPC5 finally making its uh, knocked on the door. And he was saying that, uh, he was telling me that the cash assistance programs in Somalia are going to run out at the end of March, and the in-kind assistance are going to run out at the end of April. I'm sure that's, you know, not, I'm sure there's more detail about that. And at the moment, getting donor support for what we know is going to be a cataclysmic moment in the history of the Horn of Africa, in the history of our community, we're doing it with empty hands. And he went on to tell me that in Ethiopia, where also, of course, there are droughts and, and the, the, the actuality or potential of famine, that Ethiopia had smartly managed to secure $280 million or something like that of Green Climate Fund money. Somalia hadn't, why not? Because the Somali government doesn't have quite the same skills and resources as the Ethiopian. That is not the way. That is not the way for the world to judge where money should be well spent. So climate for us is both an extraordinary threat, an undeserved threat, an unjust threat to the people that we, that we work with and for, but it also needs to be disentangled so that they get money out the door instead of keeping it of, um, uh, as promises made, but promises not kept. And, 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 and I would, would end, if, if I may, on, on this, that, the, that I think climate is going to be our worst companion now in these coming years, worse than conflict in many ways, doubling with conflict in many of these places. What that means is partly there is there are financial issues, but there's programming issues. We need to use climate data to anticipate reaction. Jörg has also already mentioned. There's a lot more to do on that. We need to have a sea change in the way we act and react. And we need, finally, 
the passion of the climate community. You know, when I was growing up, the humanitarian community was a passionate activist community. Um, no com competitors for the, the activism, the passion, the, the drama, the energy of our community. Over the last 10 years, there's been a huge professionalization of it, and that's good, but somewhat at the expense of passion. Not actually in ICFA, but in other parts of our community. <coughs> Climate, youth, the activism of that community should be an inspiration for us. And we need to build back the color of human humanitarianism if we're gonna actually live up to our responsibilities. So we are at a crucial inflection point. Climate knocking on the door, money not knocking on the door. Affected people only heard from time to time. We have the opportunity to do this because I, I know this is true. I was talking to Sophia about this just now coming on, onto the platform. We do share common values. There's no question about it. We need to revisit them and we need to put them here instead of there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for those comments. I think it was extremely important to see how you, how you broke them down. And when you, when you spoke about um, how money can be much better spent, you reminded me of one of our, our advocacy messages about less paper, more aid. And um, I think that's uh, something that's quite relevant coming up. And then we talk about breaking the silos, opening up the dialogues with other actors, humanitarian development, peace building actors as well. Um, lastly, we strong mention of climate and bringing passion more into climate. Sometimes we are avoiding this in the humanitarian action or, you know, kind of leaving it on its own level. So it's really good to re see you reaffirm the importance of bringing climate um, at this, back into our work and uh, uh, a better preparation for the future. And lastly, I really want to thank you for putting, speaking about putting people at the center of our programming and the importance of local action. So with that said, it's actually an honor to have with us today on our panel, a leader of the local NGO community um, in the humanitarian space. Um, Ms. Taiba Rahman, we are continuously hearing about the challenges being even more prevalent when it comes to accessing funding for local actors. How do you navigate the current uh, challenging situation in Afghanistan? Thank you so much. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, this is such a honor to be here among you. I just come from Afghanistan to attend this conference. I would like to thank you very sincerely from Mr. Ignacio and Ms. Kea, wherever you are, to having me, to invite me today, today here to be with you. I am, my name is Taiba Rahim. I am the president and founder of Naikala Association engaged in central rural Afghanistan. I would like to share with you that uh, since all of you, when you are thinking word, the word of Afghanistan, all of you, many of you have many image and those images are not very positive image, very dramatic. Since 1990, uh, 1979, already a very poor country, very, very undeveloped country, known only war up to today, and the need remains very, very high. Today, nearly or over 28 million people need, in, in big need, and that's the highest maybe humanitarian aid today is happening in Afghanistan. Girl education, women ban working, today is happening, and these are all the true reality that we are facing. Me, as a president of organization, I made a choice to continue our work that already very challenging situation, and among rare women-led organization who are continuing to, to give hope and to, for myself, actually, I don't allow myself, I don't have the luxury to think or to doubt or to wait. It's only one to continue. We are engaged in one of the most remote, poor, and isolated region of central Afghanistan. They are caught up in the middle of mountain, far, far, far before this current situation, they are living with, 
with extreme poverty. And one of the reasons is that there is, throughout history, historically this region remained very isolated and also the, the imbalance uh, um, support of between humanitarian and development, and the imbalance support between rural and urban, that's the region. And also these regions are very, very isolated geographically. Very little land is uh, fertile, is available. This makes the life, especially recently the drought, it made life even more unforgiving. And this is so tough, and that today these are the people that they are, that's why that one of the very interesting points that all, always gave us hope is that these, this tough situation, geographically, politically, historically, made these people, made these people resilient. And that's something that they are holding on education. And this is so impressive to see that education, they see the only way of extracting themselves from deep poverty and to move forward to to go forward. This region has one of the highest number of enrolled education boys and girls, and that's something that, that's how that they learn, that only education can help them to move forward. And today, that's why we are, since nearly 20 years, we're accompanying these communities, these determined, courageous communities, in spite of poverty, they are saying this is the only way to move forward. We have been very, we are very proud and to accompany these people and building more than 12 schools in this region. And today we are managing and uh, implementing over hundreds of community education for those people and giving them hope. And that's something that they are, uh, they, they are over also 100 teachers today right now we are giving them hope, salary, job. And that's something that this community is needing and to just accompany these people. And that's why that I would like to share with you, for this project, I am in dialogue with current authorities. I discuss with them. I make sure that every single project are approved by the authority today. And that's the only way to implement our project and to give hope. And also as a women-led organization also, is that this is part of the change in our society. This is my role. This is time for Afghan men and women to that we have to face our realities. We have to face the challenge. And this, the way that I'm active, this is part of the change in influencing the current situation. We have to bring change. But at the same time also, we need international community support. We need donor support. And I have two concrete wish and would like to share with you. Is one of them is that international community and donor, if really one is caring about women destiny, children in the current situation in such a cannot be more severe than today what we are what we are in. And that dialogue and sit with authority, discuss with them, listen and influence. It's really the only way to move forward to bring the change in Afghanistan for the sake of those women that today we are all of us who are talking that we are worried about their destiny. And my second wish is that really I'm struggling the, among the rare, there is also another, many other, uh, not a lot, but there are a dozen, very uh, limited number, women-led organizations, they are struggling. Their challenge is funding a multiple year funding, predictable funding, and today imagine the challenge, if you ask me what is my challenge, my challenge is funding, predictable, just a little bit breathe to say, okay, uh, not after six months, oh, what about money? We, we have to focus in this situation, how can we deal with current authority, how can we deal with poverty, with community to bring them hope, not the funding. And that's something is so important that, uh, and also another uh, point that I would like to share, that the requirement for asking for fund is very, very far more complicated. The kind of requirement, the model that donors, that they are, it's made only for big organization. Small organization will never fulfill those kind of forms. It's designed for the big, big, big organization, not for small. I keep, I'm one of those examples I can tell you is that I'm regularly being rejected because you are not fulfilling our requirement. And that's the challenge. And this is, I would like to, uh, I hope there will be more opportunity if you have any question. I would like to conclude with one story. The story is about a teacher. 
in August 2001, when the, the situation has changed, the government has changed, entire population, 30 million population went in panic. What shall happen in our future? What will happen? And one of our teachers, among our 100 teachers, they decided with family to leave to an un unknown destination. And they left for 24 hours just driving somewhere, no, not knowing, out of fear, out of unknown uncertainty of situation, they left. And then she cried so much that her family decided to travel back to this rural area. And when, while she returned to her village, it's the most extraordinary humanity that uh, put us all under pressure, make us responsible, make us feel that we cannot leave those people alone. Children were standing in front of class, said to the teacher very innocent way, why the class is closed? Teacher, why you are late? Actually, she already left for 40 hour driving and she decided to come back. And that's what she said, she took the key, she opened, she said, I will never. And imagine this beautiful teacher, she needs with dignity. That's what, that really I would like that asking for a long term development projects that if, if international community, that they had all the chance the last 20 year, heavy presence in Afghanistan, if they would have in invested in more development program. Today, Afghan people have less problem with coping with current situation. You cannot, we cannot, the whole world, I would like to say very clearly, we cannot, the humanitarian is supposed to be for a few years. It's an emergency, not for two decades. And Afghanistan is kept in need for decades and decades, very little, in uh, balance with the, with the development program. Look at this teacher. We are paying her only $50. Maybe you will not imagine, but that's what gave them hope. Her father, her husband, her brother, all of them. She's a proud breadwinner of the ho house in this situation. And let's keep this hope alive for those children that we owe all of us for the new generation, for all of us that we are talking and we are talking about localization. Please help us. Do not, I hope one day will not hear that organizations such as ours will drop out of the from the bridge because we were lacking funding. Thank you very much. Thank you. It is always such an inspiration to hear from Taiba and to really to highlight the resilience of the Afghan community, but more so the women leaders in the community and the local organizations that are taking action, drastic measures to go through, to continue daily life and to ensure that the basic rights are met. So thank you so much for highlighting that and for sharing these wonderful pictures with us that you had. Um, you mentioned again, uh, similar to what Mr. Martin mentioned earlier about listening, discussion putting people at the center. And I think this is a, a, a theme that's coming up that's extremely important to continue talking about. And then for zooming in on this, uh, on the funding situation for local organizations in Afghanistan to talk more about the need for multi-year flexible, predictable funding. So thank you so much for that. Thank you again. At this time, um, uh, Sophia, if you can give us your insights on actually improving the NGO access to humanitarian quality funding um, for INGOs specifically, and what are some lessons learned that you can share and experiences from your side as well? Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, and thank you for the opportunity of, of being here, learning from you, and, and having this really important dialogues. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to be part of this very uh, esteemed panel, and uh, it's, it's truly an honor to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I, I want to share a few thoughts on quality funding, because of course, volume of funding matters. It is critical, the volume, but, and we depend on it in order to deliver our um, humanitarian mandate, all NGOs, local and international, but quality of funding matters even more. That's absolutely essential because without it, we actually cannot achieve the goals that we have set out to do. And I want to, of course, how would I not uh, share from our experience, CARES experience, what that may look like and how that has changed over years. Um, of course, donors are critical also because the more quality funding we get from donors, in theory, the more quality funding we can also uh, cascade to our partners, in theory.
but I say in theory because often, and I think that's often true for many international NGOs and you and agencies, if I may say, Martin, you refer to the beast, to, <laughs> to the beast. We actually put rules on top of rules. One <laughs> Somali NGO very helpfully provided me, us feedback and uh, said that they refer to us as the care of a thousand papers. That's the label they had put on us. So very conscious of that, and, and we do that often, kind of as an excuse, we say, oh, we need to manage risks, but we actually layer on top of already heavy <coughs> rules, even more rules. So I, I do want to, um, you know, kind of say a mea culpa in that regard, because here, unless we admit that we are part of the problem, we cannot be part of the solution. And I think we are part of the problem, <coughs> absolutely so. So, um, in fact, um, some of you may have witnessed that care of a thousand papers, and for that I apologize, because we are in a learning journey. And some of you may have witnessed better practices, and good practices even from us. So of that, of course, I'm proud, but bear with us, because this is a transformation journey. It doesn't happen overnight, and we are learning together with all local NGOs along the way. Maybe some positives, and I think Actually, the reckoning that the sector has been going through around decolonizing our sector, racism in our sector has been so important because I think I can now proudly say that from 2021 to 2022, so in just one year, care as volume of unearmarked and multi-year funding increased from 24% to 55% in just one year. And I think that would not have happened without that reckoning from 24 to 55%. It would not have happened. You know, I think that pressure was really absolutely essential that the sector also felt, like many other sectors in the world, but we as well. And I would say also COVID played a part too, because not only was responsibility, you know, more shared with local partners, given all the limitations we faced, with COVID, but also authority. Not only um, responsibility was transferred, but authority as well. And fortunately, with these two f kind of factors combined, I think there is no turning back. And I don't think we would have seen that massive increase in multi-year and um, unearmarked funding would it not have been for these two factors. So that's uh, very important. But and actually, uh, recently, you know, Ukrainian NGOs told us that what they want from us, you know, and, and in a recent trip of, uh, with women-led, women's rights organization with whom we partner, they very clearly told us that what they wanted is exactly what you said, more, you know, less uh, earmarked funding, much more flexible and multi-year, because you don't know how things might go. So this is really a focus, but I think, um, it's not enough to talk about some of the technical fixes of funding. Technical fixes are important, and I call, you know, kind of less earmarked or softly earmarked multi-year funding, those are technical fixes. More important than that, than that and that's what the, all of you have referred to, is actually the issue of quality partnership, deep partnership. It cannot just be about those technical fixes. And, um, and for that, I think it's about shifting power, not only this technical fixes, but it's more about decision-making power on how to use the resources, in which way to our local partners. And I must be frank, that's often where, within our, my, my own colleagues and care, where we have the largest resistance, the, the resistance to, you know, really shifting the power on who decides, you know, the use of resources. So quality funding to me is fundamentally about shifting power, not about technical fixes. And, um, and that, of course, requires that we develop a rapport with local NGOs based on trust, grounded in local practice, grounded on what NGOs really want to focus on. So trust is here the answer not those technical uh, fixes. And in fact, I think 
that you know, shifting power to NGOs means that NGOs, local NGOs that refuse to accept funding that is overly complex, the care of a thousand papers, bureaucratic, that refuse some of the compliance requirement that often we put on top of the, do of the donor requirements should be applauded and not be treated as parias. They sh really should be applauded because they are showing us the way. And, uh, and I think it's very important that that open dialogue exists. So some of the things we, we have been doing in order to get there, and believe me, these are old habits that are very difficult to shake off. You know, my everyday effort is attempt to shake these ways of working off. And it doesn't happen overnight, but it requires a purposeful and very determined effort because ultimately this is what our work is about. Nothing about us without us. That's the slogan that has accompanied my life and that's the world we want to contribute to. And that requires also, honestly, quite a lot of internal change within care. Um, you know, in, in a recent survey uh, and, and constant surveying of partners and feedback from partners and that trust, uh, trusting uh, relationship and, and that establishment, you know, they told us, 70 partners actually recently told us that the change that they wanted was actually quite different than the change that care staff wanted. They ranked, for example, much, much higher in the survey results that, uh, you know, there should be more tolerance with financial reports, mistakes and errors that our staff felt much more attached to, that there's, those, of course, couldn't happen, that they m much more decisions on how to spend the grants than what care staff were willing to do. So constantly we need that feedback, we need to listen. We really need to listen very, very carefully to that feedback. Language matters as well. We need to get away. Probably many INGOs used to call, you know, our agreements with partners, sub-grantees, sub-granting, that in itself shows a certain way of holding power. It must be much more about mutuality, about reciprocity. So now we have funding agreements that are not sub-grantees, why would we even use that kind of language where uh, we all agree what the components of those funding agreements should be? Um, and maybe one more point, what matters enormously here is behavioral change from our own teams. And, you know, kind of deeply reflection, deep reflection around power and partnership that is very important. Often it's our program staff that do more of that, but including our finance staff, our com auditors, our compliance staff in those dialogues as well is absolutely critical. So um, without that um, and without those internal dialogues and with our partners and carefully listening, we will not make a dent on this really um, abysmal issues, I think, because they are that the sector is still confronted with. Maybe a word to the skeptics. I always like to include a word to the skeptics in probably most of my dialogues because there always are skeptics that, um, that say, well, but, you know, well, but it will then therefore be less at scale or not as fast or less reliable. Our experience from that dramatic shift from 24% to 55% is exactly the opposite. It's exactly the opposite, which is that the more we do unearmarked or softly earmarked funding and multi-year funding, actually we have greater mutual accountability and better results, actually better impact. So that cannot be ex an excuse for not shifting the power in the way we say we want to shift it. And maybe a final uh, point I want to um, put on the table. Of course, that requires humbly listening and forgive us as well if your experience has not been that because, you know, in, in large INGOs, you will find different teams behaving in different ways. But be assured we're, that we are on that journey. But my final word is actually for donors. 
because um, donors need to help us by granting this kind of unearmarked, softly earmarked, multi-year funding. It's absolutely essential and hold us accountable, the recipients of that funding that uh, are often intermediaries and are supposed to cascade funding, hold us accountable for doing it well based on the principles uh, and the power shift just uh, laid out. Um, unless this happens, the, the much needed transformation of, of the system will simply uh, not be brought to life. So um, anyway, I wanted to tell you a little bit of a story of what have been, you know, has been our experience that is much more than the technical fixes. It's about the power ship shift. It's about the partnership. It's about carefully listening and, and, and holding ourselves to account and hopefully also feeling the donor pressure to do much better than we've done to date. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sophia, for taking us on this transformational journey of care. I think it's uh, extremely useful to hear from the experiences of the INGOs what has our lessons learned that as we go through the process, um, what can be improved and uh, areas uh, uh, that <clears throat> we're excelling at. And I think it's really, uh, again, to reaffirm uh, localization through your work and talking, I really like the slogan, nothing about us without us. So I think this is something for everyone to take away. Thank you very much for that. And at this time, um, I want to ask you, Ignacio, to, in your role as executive director of a global humanitarian NGO network and having an outlook of the overall financing climate, and after listening to all of our distinguished panelists and guests today, what are the current trends uh, and challenges in the humanitarian finance uh, <clears throat> sector? And given these challenges, how can we as NGOs act collectively? You, you put quite a panel there. What, I, what yeah. can, how, can I follow up on that? You know, <laughs> I think I would, I would like to start by, when we're talking about financing, what each of the speakers has put top, and I thought, Taiba, you were great in putting that, is around giving hope. It's around the dignity. Eh? The money is just the means. The intention behind the money has to be really very strong in the way we operate. I'm going to come with some top points, but I really wanted to come back to one point that you said, Sophia. I'm not sure I want to rejoice with the percentage on flexible funding, because where is that flexible funding going? And if we talk about power shift, we also have to look at where the money is going. And the trend is that it goes, it increases uh, uh, going into the very large players. And then, as you also explained, the flexible funding, the donors may be happy because they are giving flexible funding, but then it is all the system that makes it less flexible. So sometimes the donors are doing their job. It's just that afterwards, the system that we have in, in place makes it very more difficult. I'll try and be as brief as possible, because I know in the room there are a number of people that are here in Geneva that would be speaking as eloquently as Taiba about what happens when you don't have those small amounts of money in national or organizations and that the, the, the high cost and the, the timing to bring it there. So it's, and we've said it, it's not only about signing larger checks, it is around this quality uh, funding. And uh, there is, of course, not enough money, but it's not enough money that arrives at the right, the, the right place, in the right way, and on, in the right time. And that, I think, summarizes a lot what has been discussed there, those three elements, which are the key uh, pointers of, uh, also of this, uh, of this conference. And uh, uh, we, you hear it from Taiba, while we discuss about our plans and how to move financing and so on, I mean, we hear it, the situation is really dire and, and where we can imp improve if we have our systems better in place, in better using the resources that, uh, that we have. It's, it's urgent, there's a sense of urgency. And um, 
it's wonderful how we all agree around all this. It's just that the incentives in the system, and we know our system is not prone for changes. So where are the leverage points between donors, the, the UN, the uh, INGOs, the uh, national NGOs and other actors to be able to put the right incentives? The large UN agencies do play an important role, but they cannot be proud in getting into budgets of $12 billion. That's not how we're going to be sharing the, 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 the power within the, within the system. Um, and we do struggle, and the three elements came there. We do str struggle, and this is before going to talk more about finance, we do struggle around three top questions. And that's been for decades. Localization, uh, putting affected people at the center of all what, uh, what we do, and also the long-term solutions. And now, with all these challenges that we gave, where should we be uh, focusing on and so on? And it's not new, but it's, uh, we need to do better with what we have. That's the first thing. We can, do f we can bring the funding that we have in a far better way than we are uh, uh, currently uh, doing. We need to work to reduce uh, the burden on the humanitarian uh, system. And thirdly, we of course need to find new sources of, uh, of funding. And conscious of, uh, of time and, and that there are many people here that uh, certainly would probably want to have a short um, intervention. I would like to um, to focus more on the one on how uh, we engage and and actually Martin, it was good because actually Costas is there. Costas who made the the reference from Intersos, the the, the reference of where where is the platform where we we're all discussing uh, 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 together between uh, the the development, the the climate, the the humanitarians, and. Um, we have to better define where are our limits as uh, humanitarians. And uh, uh, as you were saying, Martin, is uh, uh, emptying the, 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 the silos and, and connecting the, the pieces. The, the caseloads are just growing, but it's not necessarily for the humanitarians to, to be covering. Uh, the social protection systems, for instance, in different countries, must adapt uh, and contribute also with people that fall into the level of poverty. And the boundaries of what we, we are doing is, is a top consideration also because uh, we're getting so overstretched. And um, I'd like to finish then also in going, going back on what unites us and that we're all extremely committed and lovely people in the sector. But how come we're not finding the keys to be able to unlock these different negative incentives and that we just, of course there is progress, there are, but there's this sense of urgency that this has to happen at a very large scale and much, much faster. And I stop here. <laughs> I won't be doing, uh, giving justice, just to give a point to, to the grand bargain, uh, uh, of course, which is also part of the discussion uh, here, where there are so many commitments that have been taken and that we are struggling to, to implement. Just, just sorry, uh, bef be, just that last one. It, because, if not, because, you know, the, the colleagues make a big effort to prepare. Actually, everybody had uh, papers except Taiba. <laughs> eh? So I think that's really extraordinary also. And you were so eloquent and so clear in what you were bringing as a contribution. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ignacio. And actually, by highlighting <clears throat> some of the challenges, we realize that it's also what everyone said is our needs to move forward. So localization, putting effective people at the center, long-term solution. So their, their desire from everyone on the panel, but they're also highlighted as challenges. And, we re and thank you for highlighting the need to reduce the burden on the humanitarian system and talk more about funding quality, quantity, and timeliness. So 
about this, you left with also asking the questions about next steps and what can we do better? I guess my, uh, uh, at this time we wanna open for Q&A and maybe we'll take three to four questions first and then you can direct them either to the entire panel or to a specific person and uh, we'll go from there. So any questions? Okay, I have one, two, three, four. Those are the first four hands, Nabil. <clears throat> yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I want just to reflect on uh, Sophia uh, about the unremarked uh, look uh, fund. Uh, what uh, what I think it is a good uh, way, and it is like I wouldn't say it is a trend, but it is like a good way in doing the business, and it I can see it like for the past five years. What I'm thinking about it, it is a good chance for NGOs so that they can also build their own capacity, capacity development, capacity strengthening, and that uh, the donor doesn't know it all uh, because, yeah, there is proposals, there is concept papers, but at the end of the day, the, um, the, um, the NGO in the ground, they know, they know much better than this. And I wouldn't see there is like development industry, but there is a development industry. There is no like humanitarian action industry uh, I mean I wouldn't say it in the bad way but in the good way I mean humanitarian action industry so this industry needs investment needs infrastructure thank you thank you I think we had a question up there Mahdi, right there Je pense que C'est bon, ma voix. Merci. Euh, malheureusement, je, je vais parler en français, pas en anglais directement. Ma collègue va traduire. Merci pour uh, cette opportunité. Uh, sorry, I would speak in, uh, in French and uh, my colleague would translate for me. Moi, c'est El Mehdi Ag Wakina, directeur de l'association malienne pour la survie au Sahel au Mali. Um, El Midi, I'm coming from Mali, from uh, uh, one local organization. Okay. Donc, ma question, c'est, je reviens, c'est un commentaire par rapport euh, aux besoins croissants et vraiment à l'aide qui est en train vraiment de diminuer. Si nous prenons le cas du Mali. A quick comment on increasing needs and uh, limited funding. And I want to give the case of Mali. Nous savons que la situation est extrêmement complexe et tous les jours les déplacés internes sont énormes. We know that the situation is very much complex and every day we are having more internal displaced people. Et l'aide humanitaire ne fait que diminuer. And the humanitarian assistance is reducing. Nous savons que l'année passée en 2022 Il y a eu à peu près 30% de mobilisation des ressources par rapport au plan de réponse 2022. Uh, last year, we had 30% uh, uh, fund mobilization on the humanitarian response plan. Et cette année, la situation continue aussi à être très sérieuse par rapport à ces déplacés. And this year, again, we can see that the situation is getting worse. Donc, nous, nous profitons de cette tribune pour lancer un appel par rapport au principe de l'humanité pour venir en appui à ces populations qui n'ont rien fait pour mériter cette situation. We are seizing this opportunity to make a call uh, on the humanity principle and, and ask uh, for greater attention uh, to relieve this population who are living uh, hard time. Le deuxième point, c'est par rapport au financement direct aux ONG nationales. The second point is related to direct funding to local NGOs. Tant qu'on ne compte, on, on, euh, on, 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 on enlève pas les stéréotypes que les ONG nationales ont manque de capacité, on ne va pas avancer. Unless we remove the stereotypes types, uh, saying that local NGOs have no capacity, we are not going to make any progress. Et là, les, les agences et les organisations internationales ont du travail à faire par rapport à leurs équipes sur le terrain. 
And here I would like to call uh, uh, agencies and international organization and say that they have, the teams have a lot to do in the field to improve that. Parce que beaucoup d'organisations internationales ne veulent pas allouer les overhead pour les organisations nationales. A lot of uh, international NGOs uh, do not want to give uh, overheads uh, to uh, local organizations. Et en matière de rémunération, on a des, des barèmes qui sont là pour les ONG nationales. On ne, on ne peut pas atteindre un tel niveau de salaire pour des staffs. And also there are limitations regarding uh, uh, staff uh, income. Uh, we're having some uh, sailings and we cannot do, uh, go higher than certain amounts. Et on sait que c'est les ONG nationales qui sont au devant de la scène quand il y a une crise. But we do know that uh, local actors are those who are at the forefront uh, when there are crises. Donc, un peu de justice dans l'humanitaire est nécessaire. So I'm calling for a more justice in humanitarian work. Je vous remercie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> uh, right here in uh, front, this uh, woman with the jacket in the second row. Thank you very much. My name is Smruti Patel, and I'm representing Alliance for Empowering Partnerships. We are signatory of the Grand Bargain, and we sit in the facilitation group. Um, just thank you so much for the, this, the passion and the real uh, inspirational uh, sharing, uh, Taiba. That was just, this is exactly what we need to, coming from the heart. Um, I just want to bring two things um, to the discussion. There's been a lot of discussions around supporting women-led organizations, and we've heard this repeatedly in the last two years, which is really great. The reality of local women organization, and we've done consultation recently, is that they're continuing to be exploited. Now, they're being approached by those same organizations who are committed but not being asked for equal partnership. So in a way, they're raising funds in their name, but they're not getting the funding in a quality way, able to make decisions about the programming. So how can we deal with that? Because this is exploitation in the worst kind, right? Second part is the women who do speak up and who are brave enough, and I think, Sophia, you said, some will refuse the, the, the funding. They don't have that luxury. They don't have that luxury. And the ones who do speak up, they get backlash. How do we stop that backlash? Because I can tell you, those women are really suffering. We need to have some kind of mechanism where they can come to so they can get support when there are these difficult issues uh, with um, communicating with international NGOs, UN partners, because it's really difficult for them. So I really urge <laughs> that we really provide support uh, that's necessary to accompany them. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we'll take maybe one or two more. Uh, this is hard. Who went up? <laughs> okay, uh, sir. And then we'll take one more after that, and then we'll have to pause for questions. Thank you very much for this excellent uh, presentation. <clears throat> but I would like uh, re really to know <clears throat> your views of whether the problem of funding is it a problem of donors or recipients? I know you talked about value and the quality, but when we say the problem of donors, some donors decide the areas of funding or the priorities for funding, for gender, whatever, and uh, those donors, uh, from the view of some, they don't address the root causes of problems in certain areas. Just they would like to take the formalities of things to give the impressions uh, that we are, uh, uh, the impressions reflecting the views of the donors. Or is it the problems of the recipients who misuse that funding or who has some negative attitudes within the local communities or within the countries? So if you were to be 
ask, you have two choices. Is it a problem of donors or a problem of recipients? I don't like the answer of both, of course. It's easier to say both. But which is the most appropriate answer to this question? Thank you. Thank you. We'll do one from the very back because we haven't had to. Uh, please. And in the blue shirt, yes. <laughs> and then we'll stop and we'll take responses. Good morning. My name is Berke. I work with Trokra, which is the Irish Caritas. Trokra is a partner-based organization, um, and we are also signatories of the Grand Bargain and the Charter for Change. So Trokra works entirely through partners, and I would like to come to what His Excellency said, um, Jörg Laube, around um, sharing ICR or overhead costs. So Trokra has implemented a policy, mandatory, that we share all our ICR, 50% with the local partners. In addition, we include 5% of the budgets to capacity sharing or capacity strengthening so that local partners actually have a bit of a reserve um, in order to, according to their priorities, um, you know, establish more institutional capacity. Um, the, the one recommendation or the request I would have for Switzerland is um, to please share those practices with your donor colleagues. Um, and also with other organizations so that we can actually advance more uh, the localization agenda. My second point is for Mr. Griffith on um, what you mentioned around climate change and humanitarian action. And while maybe the time isn't right for um, a World Humanitarian Summit 2.0, we've got um, the COP28 coming up. And I think climate change and humanitarian action will need to be part of that agenda. So particularly when we look into um, fragile conflict affected states and maybe just the appetite for, you know, making that linkage between humanitarian action and climate change is so important. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I know there's so many hands, but let's uh, take uh, uh, some feedback. Maybe we can start from the last question and move our way to the first. So, Mr. Ambassador, if you can talk a little bit about just that reflection on sharing the procedures uh, with the donors, colleagues, and specifically um, amounts to local capacity building. And then, uh, Mr. Uh, Griffith, if you can talk about your thoughts on World Humanitarian Summit 2.0. <laughs> Thank you much. Um, as I said in the beginning, we really, really try to talk to our intermediaries and, and motivate them, push them to uh, also share in the overhead costs of the implementing uh, NGOs. And I, uh, en, en réponse peut-être à votre question, moi, je ne pense pas tellement que nous, on a un stéréotype qu'il y a manque de capacité. On, on reconnaît peut-être qu'il faut um, aider à développer la capacité des, des, des ONG sur place, mais je ne pense pas qu'on a un stéréotype négatif vis-à-vis -vis des ONG euh, sur place. Mais merci de nous rappeler qu'il faut faire davantage des efforts pour, pour leur aider de développer euh, leur capacité. Uh, we certainly talk to our uh, friends and co-other uh, donors. We have different uh, formats here in Geneva. That's one of the advantages. Uh, here, the donors are here, they have the humanitarian experts here. I'm looking at Anne, the humanitarian expert in my mission, on her level with my colleagues, ambassadors. That's uh, very much happening, but thanks also for that, uh, for that recommendation. And uh, you won't like my answer, but it is both. Uh, and I also um, don't, I think we should not make this like, um, you know, like systematically uh, portray it as if there were these two sides. I would like to think of us as a community with donors, with the intermediaries, with local NGOs, with recipients. We have to approach this really collectively and not think of each other as, as like, uh, you know, on the other side. And then I think when every of us, every part of this collectivity is aware of where we need to improve, and, and you heard some ideas from, from the colleagues on the panel, I think that's the way to make progress. Thanks. Thank you very much. On COP, I, um, I went to COP27, first time I'd ever had any such exposure. I was quite struck by the absence of the humanitarian community as a collective. I, I was appalled by, by you, know, uh, you know, criticizing myself as well, obviously. Um, and it, it's, it, it wasn't, wasn't good enough. Of course, many, many humanitarian and development organizations were there. But there wasn't a collective purpose going in as to what we were trying to do. There's a discussion at the moment, certainly within uh, OCHA and our, some of our partners, 
on how to approach the issue, uh, the climate issue going into COP28 in terms of advocacy. Uh, I think, um, but I think I'm not in a majority, that the most important thing for the humanitarian community to put in front of COP28 or any other such uh, fora is the impact on frontline communities. We shouldn't start with money, essentially, and that is the debate that we're having at the moment. Let's start with trying to liberate climate money to get it out of the door much quicker than it has done. That's not too difficult, by the way. Um, but others say, look, the witnessing, the observation you'll be seeing in Mali of the impact of continuing drought, floods there as well, on frontline communities, this is a witnessing which we need to import into the climate debate because it isn't there sufficiently. I think that's very clear. We then need to build from there, and I think COP28 is, is, a, is an opportunity. Uh, the, we then need to build from there as to how can the promises made by governments across the world actually be put into practical reality for those communities in which we may have a role. But, it, but it, crucially, it's not uh, an opportunity for us to get more money. It's an opportunity for us to do our fundamental responsibility as a community, local, international, global, which is to tell the <laughs> truth about the impact of climate and to make that truth clear in COP28 and beyond. So we're having a debate at the moment about it, and I welcome all advice as to where we should prioritize. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sophia, can you actually reflect, you had two, uh, the very first question about reflection on funding and uh, the fact that there was no humanitarian industry like there is a development one. And then there was another one from Alliance uh, talking about not having the luxury to speak up, as you had mentioned, in refusal of funding. Mm -hmm. So. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Well, I'll just, I'll pass over to Sophia to answer those two questions. <laughs> no, thanks so much for those questions and reflections. And precisely, it is about, you know, avoiding the kind of exploitation that you mentioned. And precisely when NGOs speak up and say, you know, listen, the, the rules you're imposing on us are just absurdity at all. And, and they're even bigger and heavier than the ones that the donor had, you know, uh, included in, in the agreement with you. That's precisely where I think that kind of feedback and engagement is so essential. And hearing that feedback, and as you say, you know, if, if uh, those NGOs are, are treated like parias, that that is something to, to really denounce, you know? This is about the passion you mentioned, you know? This is about the values. Be passionate again so that we all also reflect based on, on that passion. Actually, I think, you know, it is about, you know, INGOs can often be more the intermediary. Well, that's wrong. It should really be partnership. And it's not about transferring the risk to local NGOs or national NGOs. It's all about, and that's why new concepts such as, you know, well, collaborative compliance, not just compliance, you know, shared risk management. It's not about transferring the risk. It's about sharing the risk and working this out together and not just being, you know, um, a, a source of or a transfer of or intermediary of resources. That's why I come back to partnership as the key word, not just you know, to those technical fixes. I would also say, I'm, I'm not a fan, some of you have heard me say that, actually of the word localization, because it suggests that it's about localizing what INGOs and UN agencies have done, when it suggests it's like, others will do the same, like what we have traditionally done, and that's absolutely wrong. That's why I prefer the concept of locally led, because it's led locally. It's not about localizing what the international community has done. It's locally led and hopefully globally connected. And global solidarity matters here enormously. So it's led by, you know, the people of Afghanistan. It's, by the way, you know, 
nothing about us without us is, is not, I wish it was my slogan, it's really a strong feminist slogan from the feminist movement and, and to which I absolutely adhere because it is about, you know, everything being locally led <coughs> and globally connected. And, and that global solidarity is essential, you know, is absolutely essential to have success. But it is about justice. It is about, you know, locally led humanitarian response that is globally connected. It is about, you know, sharing risk and working this out together and not one or the other. That, that uh, would be the points I would like to highlight a bit more. Thank you, thank you very much. And of course, Taiba, please talk to us about partnership and uh, your, your intervention. Thank you very much. There was a very important point has been raised about uh, supporting women-led organization. Indeed, uh, for me, when I see there are some six, seven women-led organizations that I'm in contact with them, uh, there is suddenly we hear a very big wave of uh, news that there is a fund is available for women. So it lets all of us, we apply. And then suddenly, in a kind of mysterious way, it disappears. I don't know why. Suddenly she calls me that, uh, actually, I already feel guilty. Maybe I'm dropped because maybe we did feel nicely already to fill the forum it's a some of them are cert certain language that I don't think if I even I can find it in dictionary each time when I fill the forum I look at dictionary Google tra Google translation the dictionary book I'm looking none of them was words are even available to how to translate in order to fill that I'm sure this is something about people I'm sure it's something about vulnerability of the community it must be but that's just a language and I call people, they say, oh, did you call the donor? I'm saying, no, they're not available. The deadline is in two days. And then suddenly we are filling, and then, first of all, I feel, just to share very honest experience, I feel guilty, maybe I'm sure we did. I'm sure I'm saying, I have done wrong. That's gone, completely forget, even don't even, R r write the email that whether I was, we passed or not. Suddenly, all the women call me, says, Taiba, did you get? Because we, we feel bad. I'm sh I, at least you should have gotten it. I'm saying, no, not at all. Didn't you hear? So this is somehow, I don't know where it goes. It's somehow, there is a lot of news that deadline is, uh, uh, we are today at t 10 of March, deadline is 14 of March. And the form is more than 60 page. And, uh, and also, it doesn't matter, we can work even at night, but the vocabulary we have to find out, those kind of language, those kind of explanation. And uh, to be honest, yes, we do want to. I don't want any forum to be easy for us, because I would feel so proud that we should be developing our capacity. And that's something what you are mentioning. How can we be competitive also? We don't want pity. Oh, this oh little little woman, let's support them in this current situation. There's so much. No, we don't want pity. We want the pride, we want the capacity building training workshop to get familiar to those vocabularies, to get familiar to those kind of filling the forum, also to complete those requirements. Some of those requirements are not even possible. I tell you, th three years ago, I I'm rejected by an, uh, one donor. And, the, and the, one of them, I scored very low. And then one of the reasons was we didn't have co policy car. And I told them we don't have car to, in order to have policy. They are saying, oh, because you don't have policy, you drop the score. I'm saying, I don't have car. <laughs> We're doing it at a local base. We're doing taxi from here to there. We don't have that fund. So give us the money that I buy a car, then I will make the policy. <laughs> <laughs> These are the challenges. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Taiba. I think uh, at this time, Ign uh, there, Ignacio, there's there's a, a back to the question about funding, a problem with donors or recipients, if we can uh, directly address that also, as well as um, the question from Molly talked about direct funding to local NGOs and removing those stereotypes of incapacity of local organizations, which I think Taiba just spoke to. Yeah, so we have, we have a problem, or we have problems. And generally what we do is that we can really point to the other one to say he has or he, uh, this organization has to change something. Now, as NGOs, we should also be looking at what we should be changing in the way uh, we, f we function. And I really liked the intervention of Trocair. That's practical, that is clear, that is uh, uh, ways directly of responding to some of the um, uh, uh, financial issues 
in engaging with, uh, uh, in partnership with national organizations. We need more of that. Uh, uh, we know also that all the discussion around the intermediaries is not the one which has the, the, the biggest enthusiasm by some, uh, uh, some partners, but there cer certainly is where us as NGOs, we do have a lot of work to do. And then the problem, I want to bring it at a, at, with a, a different dimension because we are here in Geneva and Jean-Jacques Rousseau is a son of Geneva. He it was uh, he revolution, revolutionized uh, uh, political thinking, and he talked about a different social contract. So this is at a really different level, but we also have to think uh, how us as societies we are functioning and what different social contract we we need. The pandemic. Uh, really gave us hope that our system will be changing uh, in, in major ways, mainly on issues around localization. It hasn't. Then we said, well, yeah, the, uh, the uh, conflict in Ukraine is also going to bring us a bigger push and so on. It hasn't. What do we need, really, to reinvigorate this element of solidarity that we see at, at really important moments at different times all over for it to be, to be a different social contract for us to be able to be in a situation like Ambassador Lober said, it's not about us and them, it's about us and there's nowhere in this planet where there is a corner where you can hide. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I am very sorry to say that I think that our time is up, actually. So, I mean, while this has been such a wonderful discussion, it should not end here. Um, we want to extend all appreciation to all of our distinguished panelists and guests for taking time out of their intense schedules, honestly, to be here with us and share their insights and experiences. And the conversation doesn't end here. You would like to? I, I want to have one word at the end. And, and now I'll open that up. So actually, while we wrap up, I think it's good to have last reflections from uh, our okay. panelists. So kick, the, kick us off with that. OK, I just want to make one thing completely clear. I I'm never, ever going to go on a panel with Ty again. <laughs> How boring, right? <laughs> it's not happening. <laughs> Ty, it's wonderful. Thank you. Well, I, I will have the honor, actually, in, in Brussels. I think on Monday we are on the same panel, so uh, I'm not sure. Get ready. I will. I will really get ready. Thank you so much, because uh, this has been so absolutely inspiring. And, um, and we are learning. We are listening. And forgive us for, you know, when we may not always be there. But um, this, this is a joint learning journey and it's it's a fantastic forum to be together and be able to reflect in this way so thank you very much thank you not much to add really i at the very beginning martin mentioned that the nexus is about um i don't know the exact remember the exact, exact wording but partnership but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's about relationships and i, I think that's uh, that is really the key bringing people together and especially also physically, you know, not just virtually and all these things we have now. And so thanks again also for doing the travel and thanks again for arranging this because that's what we achieved today, I believe. Thanks. Thank you for this opportunity that I could share what the reality is happening. Very often we are in these meetings and donor meetings. The zero is even the screen is not enough for the zeros to complete how much funding has been made available worldwide and how much it goes to Afghanistan name it, but what is happening real in the ground to bring those funds, to give hope to those communities, that's the question that I would like to learn and we have to improve. Thank you very much. Yeah, becoming fit for the, what's coming uh, in terms of humanitarian needs and so on is going to need from us humility but a lot of ambition, and we have to stick together. Thank you, and, and another round of applause for the, uh, for the panelists. Now, we hope, uh, as we wrap up just a few, a uh, couple of last sentences, we do hope that as a collective, 
w one, remembering that we are working together as a collective, and we continue to work to address the humanitarian financing gaps by advocating for improving the provision of quality funding, innovative finance approaches, and improve the effectiveness and efficiency of aid through simplification, harmonization of partnership and funding conditions. It's crucial to remind ourselves that we must continue to strengthen the engagement and leadership of local and national actors as expressed here today. And this conversation is an, is an ongoing one, and I saw there was so many questions today, but we do have a uh, extended 30-minute uh, coffee break, and it's right up these steps uh, through the doors, and there'll be uh, uh, people to guide you. And I, th I hope that we can continue this conversation and uh, uh, together and networking. And thank you again. It's an honor to be here with you today, and thank you again to all of our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.